So today, uh, we're going to be focusing on the fundamentals of secrets management. It's, it's very much going to be a one-on-one -on -one session, uh, and it's going to assume no prior knowledge. Um, so with that said, let's take a look at the agenda. What we'll do today is we'll, we'll look at identity, what it is, and the role it plays in secrets management. And then we'll look at what authentication is and the difference between that and authorization. And then we'll delve into the secret side of things and exactly what secrets are and the different types and, and different things that we could do to protect them. And we'll do extremely high level cryptography 101 uh, because this does a play a part in secrets as well. Okay, so let's get stuck into it. So we're talking about the fundamentals of secrets management and the best place to start is with this acronym, IAM. Now, what does IAM mean? Well, it's short for identity and access management. And if we think about what secrets management platforms are doing, they are tools of implementing identity and access management for organizations. So understanding it at its core, it's, it's really key to understanding what secrets management is. This is split into two sides of the same coin. Identity is on one side and access management being on the other side. Both need each other to provide any real value to any businesses. So as we go through the workshop, we'll start to build the picture up and let's, let's start with identity and exactly what identity is. So if you look it up on Google, uh, Wikipedia gives us this definition here. So it says the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. As I mentioned in the session earlier on, I am Rob Barnes, that is my identity. As the definition says, it's the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. So I've put a little bit of emphasis on the thing. So in the engineering world, Identity doesn't just refer to a user like myself. It can also refer to an application. It can refer to a system, a piece of infrastructure. All of these things can have identities. This is important to understand because when we look at access management in more detail, we need to understand that we are not only managing access for users, as in people, but we're also managing access for applications, systems, and infrastructure. So from a very high level, now that we know what identity is, it brings across the next question. What is authentication? So explain this, I'll, I'll just tell you uh, a backstory from earlier on in my career. When I first started out in uh, computing, uh, certifications was a big deal. You, you were trying to get jobs and to get those jobs, you needed to prove that you had a minimum level of competency. So my way of doing that is I had a big belief in certifications. So I took exams like CCNA when I was doing network engineering. Uh, I did things like PRINCE2 project management. Uh, I did things like uh, all the Microsoft certifications. I took so many exams. And a process to do this was quite simple. I would go online and I would register and I would book a time slot at the testing center. And then whilst I was online, I would pay an examination fee. On the day of the exam, I would turn up 15 minutes early for my exam. This was to allow time for me to check in. As part of the check-in process, I would have to produce one form of ID and proof of address. Now, the point of this story here is the testing center, or they are authenticating me as the exam taker that was registered to sit the exam. That's what authentication is. It's the process of proving identity. Were it not for authentication, I could send my buddy Tracy, for example, who's way smarter than me, uh, to take the exam for me just because I'm not qualified enough to pass the exam. So this is their way of stopping that kind of uh, fraudulent uh, cheating, I guess. So they authenticate who the uh, exam taker is. You know, every time you go to the cash machine, you withdraw money. You have to prove you are the account holder before it gives you that money. And you do this by entering a PIN. And it's all in the acronym. It stands for Personal Identification Number. Every time I go to Twitter, I log in with my handle at DevOpsRob. And I put my password in. This is me proving to Twitter that I am the account holder for this Twitter account. Now, obviously, there are ways that malicious actors can get around these authentication things. So we can do a few things to protect ourselves and add some mitigation steps to the authentication process. The first thing we can do is we can add some password complexity rules. So things like um, you can have a minimum length, for example, you could say it has to be a minimum of 12 characters um, if you want. You can enforce uh, a minimum amount of uppercase and lowercase uh, rules inside there. You can also enforce things like it must include a numerical value or a special character. This makes it harder to brute force, but it's often not enough. 
The next thing we could do is we can use something that we call multi-factor authentication. So this is an additional layer of security. Let's take Twitter, for example. In addition to entering our handle and password, Twitter can generate a one-time password as well. It sends this to a registered email address or phone number that has been verified. When you receive this, you enter the code onto Twitter and authentication is now complete. This means an attacker would not only need your credentials, but they would also need access to your email or phone. And the other way that we can do this is biometrics. Um, so anyone that's got um, a modern phone, uh, iPhones and uh, a lot of the new Android phones will be quite familiar with this. So this could be a fingerprint or it could be facial recognition or whatever uh, biometrics kind of values that your devices support. And this could be a method of authentication, which is quite common with the phones, for example, or it could be a method of multi-factor authentication. So you could have it where you're entering some kind of username and password. And as a secondary step, you would have to produce a fingerprint or you would have to do a facial scan or something like that. So from a high level, that is what authentication is. Like I say, everything we've talked about is, is surrounding identity and authentication. And this is also known as AuthN. This is the, the common terms that we tend to use in identity and access management. So now we've looked at what identity is, let's look at access management. So access management is commonly known as AuthZ. Let's take a look at a practical example of that. We use Twitter. If you can't tell by now, um, I live on Twitter. Uh, so it, when it comes to examples, it's really easy for me to use that. So we have a tweet here that I've authored. As you can see from the screenshot, I can specify who can reply to the tweet. We can think of this as like a policy or permissions, if you like. Um, so what I do when I, when I offer this is I select only people that I mention. As an unauthenticated user, I went to the tweet and attempted to reply, and I was greeted with this pop-up message. Now, it's worth noting that it's Twitter. They're, they're trying to get as many people to register on their platform as possible, so the language is uh, not entirely accurate uh, in terms of the ability to respond to this tweet. But the point is, this is an unauthenticated user, and before Twitter can evaluate whether or not I am authorized to respond to this tweet, they need to know who I am. So they require everyone to authenticate so they can check the access permissions of an entity. So I asked my wife to view the tweet. As you can see inside the red circle, the uh, comment button is grayed out. We can also see a helpful message that tells us that she's not authorized to reply to this tweet. That's what we mean by authorization. It could be managing access to files, infrastructure, data, you name it. This example is a little different because it's a social media platform. But the point is we, we have a, a policy or a permission and it evaluates the identity of the user and then runs it against a permission base and decides whether or not this action is authorized. So, I mean, that was a social media example, but when, when we start to get to enterprise, you're talking about managing uh, users a bit differently and you're doing it at scale. So, I mean, there could be hundreds, possibly thousands of entities and the things that you're managing access to. We're not talking about the tweets that someone can read. It could be access to data or it could be access to infrastructure or whatever it is. Managing access across these entities on a one-to-many basis, it just simply isn't feasible. As you can see on the left-hand side of my screen, you have uh, five different entities. And if each of them needs access to a particular thing, you would have to grant that mapping five times, right? It's much harder to keep on top of these things because as your policies grow, as your, your user base grows, um, the complexity of these mappings, it just grows with it. So instead, we can take a many-to-many -many approach. Right? We could do this by grouping entities together into logical groups, and they tend to map to business structures. There's no hard rules as to how you do this, but in general, you'll look at how a business is structured and you'll create groupings that match that. And then you would uh, assign the permissions to the groups. Should someone not need the permissions anymore, then you remove them from the group. And that is, I'd say, an industry standard way of managing permissions at scale within enterprise. This approach allows us to do this even for secrets. So one of the takeaways that I kind of want you to get from this is identity is definitely a prerequisite for secrets management. Without a robust identity structure in place, access management is not possible against secrets. So from a high level, we have sort of the I am piece. We, we understand what identity is, we understand what access management is, and we understand some very high level concepts of the role they play and how they work. Before we get into secrets management itself, it's probably smart if we ask ourselves, what is a secret? I went to my trusted friend, Google, 
and it threw up Wikipedia again. Now this is the dictionary definition that Wikipedia gives us. So it's an adjective and it's not known or seen or meant to be known or seen by others. So by this definition, we've seen some examples already in this session. Uh, we've talked about Twitter passwords. We've talked about uh, banking pins. These things are not meant to be known by others. So if we translate that into software engineering world, uh, we're looking at things like uh, database passwords, API tokens, PKI, root credentials. I mean, the list goes on. I've just named a few because there's too many to mention. But these are all examples of secrets when we're talking about software engineering. If these secrets were to get into the wrong hands, it could cause great damage to an organization. Secrets management is mainly concerned with removing secret sprawl. When we talk about secret sprawl, we talk about secrets being in too many places to track and control. I'll give you a practical example. Say a developer needs a database password. If it's sent to them in Slack, that's one place a secret exists, in Slack. Then they configure a database connection string within their config map with the password. That's another place where the, the secret exists. And then they might commit their code to source control, something like GitHub. That's another place that it exists. They have a colleague who needs to configure their application to access the same database. So in the spirit of being helpful and boosting productivity, they give this credential to their colleague. So if that's sent via Slack, again, it's in a different Slack chat now. The colleague has configured their application and so on and so forth, right? And then there could be other developers that require this as well. So they say, okay, let's make life easy for everyone. We'll just put it on our development wiki page. So that's another place where the secret is. So now we have this picture. Let's just imagine if there were if a breach were to occur and the password needed to be rotated, it's almost impossible to have full confidence that it has been changed in all places because we simply can't track everywhere it is, right? Also, when trying to understand how a breach occurred, it will be difficult to know where the leak came from as the password is sprawled absolutely everywhere. So what we have here is a huge attack surface as we have a high probability of leaks and a big impact on the event of a leak. So with this picture here, how do we actually manage secrets? And the answer is centrally. We need a centralized approach to managing secrets. All entities obtain their, their secrets from a centralized platform. It becomes the source of truth for secrets. So secrets can be either static or dynamic. Static secrets are long-lived. Um, they do not rotate unless someone goes in and manually rotates them. Like my Twitter password, for example, unless I go in and change that, it's not going to change, it's static. Dynamic secrets, they are a little bit different, right? The idea here is that an entity that needs access credentials, a set of short-lived credentials will be generated in that instance. Once they expire, the credentials are deleted this means there's minimal need to rotate passwords and the blast radius is significantly reduced, right? So I have a game I'm gonna to play to demonstrate this. My wife's nephew plays a game called Fortnite. He, he absolutely loves this game. Uh, there are parts of the game where you have to, to shoot things, right? And to practice, he uses something called uh, aim trainers. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use aim trainers to show how dynamic secrets can shorten the blast radius and reduce the attack surface, right? And I'm gonna play this game, right? So we'll start with fixed targets. Okay. So here you'll see, we have this bubble that I need to shoot. As you can see, it turns red after a period of time and it expires. That's what we call a dynamic secret. The thing with that is because I have less time to shoot it, you can think of this as a credential. A hacker has less time to hack it, basically. They can't brute force it if there's not enough time for them to brute force it, right? So, you know, the longer it takes me, the more chance it is it's going to expire. So we'll just continue with this game. And this is kind of the point of dynamic secrets. The blast radius is shorter. Had this balloon just stayed green, and just didn't move until I shot it, then I would have almost an infinite time to try to shoot it, which is the same as uh, trying to uh, breach a password. Right? So now this game is over. 
you can see uh, I had a 100% accuracy rate, uh, which you'd expect with something like this. So if we change this mode a little bit, we talk about ways that we can protect static secrets or we'll play a different game mode. Same trainer, but a different game mode. So this one, it's a little bit different. The target's moves. So I want you to think about static secrets, right? If you have static secrets and you have some kind of system that automates the periodic rotation of them, so we don't have to remember to do it, what you now have is a moving target, right? So you'll see in this game here, it's a lot harder. It's a lot harder to actually hit my target because by the time I do this, the target has moved, right? Now, it doesn't mean it's bulletproof, but what we're talking about when it comes to security is we're identifying risks and we're deciding whether the risk is acceptable or not. And if it's not acceptable, then what we're doing is we're putting in place mitigation steps. So by having a static password, which automatically rotates, what we're doing is making it harder for attackers, right? So similar to dynamic credentials in a way that it's, it's a moving target slightly different because the reason why it's moving, it's being rotated. Whereas with the dynamic credentials, they're actually expiring and you now cannot access them anymore. So I'll just quickly finish this game. And we get our results. And you can see my results are less impressive than the last one. That's because it being a moving target, it's, it's a lot harder for me to actually uh, shoot these things. So it's the same as if we just substitute that with trying to uh, breach a password. So in addition to the examples of the secrets that we mentioned earlier, there are some sensitive uh, pieces of information that our applications need to handle sometimes. So for example, it could be customers' personally, personal identifiable information uh, or PII as it's more commonly called. It could be credit card details or uh, maybe national insurance number any data that would harm your business or your customers if it were to fall into the wrong hands. So how can we protect these data points? And the answer is with cryptography. So what is cryptography? So cryptography is the science of using mathematics to encrypt and decrypt data. So if I'm gonna put it a bit more simply, cryptography is the process of scrambling and unscrambling data to mask the original content. Right. So the original data state is known as plain text. And the process of scrambling that data is known as encryption. The process of unscrambling that data is known as decryption. And the encrypted data state is known as ciphertext. So how does encryption and decryption work? Well, let's take a look at that. So encryption and decryption is achieved using a cipher, right? A cipher is just a mathematical function, often referred to as an algorithm. The cipher works with a cryptographic key. When the two are used together, they produce a specific cipher text. Keys are basically really big numbers, like really, really big numbers. And the key size is measured in bits. So the bigger the key, the more secure uh, it's considered to be. Right. So this is the workflow that shows us how encryption works. We have some plain text data. So let's just say it's a national insurance number that a user has entered into an application UI. Here in the UK, we are bound by GDPR laws and organizations have a duty of care when handling personally identifiable information. So it's a good idea to encrypt this data whilst it's in transit to its data source. Right? The application uses a combination of the cipher and the key to turn this data into cipher text. So as you can see in the middle step there, that's the encryption pairing up with the key and the resulting part is the cipher text. Then it can be stored in the data source. So that could be a database maybe. When the application needs to retrieve this data, the ciphertext uh, uses a combination of the cipher and the key to turn it back into plain text and then it can be served back to the application. Right? So we have a couple of data states here. We have uh, the data while it's in transit, uh, which is when it's moving to the data store or from the data store and you have it when it's at rest and that's when it's actually in the data store. So. We look to encrypt things when they're in transit and at rest in these kind of scenarios here. We look to identity, what identity is, the role that it plays and uh, why it's a prerequisite for secrets management. We've looked at authentication versus authorization, exactly what they are, the roles that they play and how we can achieve them. And then we've looked at the different types of secrets. So we looked at things like static secrets and dynamic secrets. And then we've done a extremely high level 
look at cryptography. Now, cryptography is a really complicated topic. I am by no means a cryptography expert. Um, I know a few of them. Um, so on that basis, I just wanted to keep it really simple. And those that are interested can start to read a bit more uh, detail into that. Um, otherwise, it can be quite intimidating from my own experience. And with that, I would like to thank you and open up the floor for questions. Mm -hmm.